Our next session was on the relationship between history, preservation, historic sites, and we were especially interested here in plantation sites. And I've always found it absolutely fascinating when you visit these old plantations that you have a range from uh, the old myths about the plantation, which we talked about earlier when we talked about those, how historians view slavery, uh, to plantations that have tried uh, increasingly to integrate the experience of enslaved peoples. Uh, but what I find interesting are the lines that are crossed and not crossed. Uh, so that, for example, many sites which have done a very good job of talking about the experience of enslaved people don't want to talk about buying and selling. Uh, so I'm curious as to how you think about uh, the ways in which these kinds of historic sites can play a role in, quite frankly, public education. In many ways, discussions about slavery are still the last great unmentionable in public discourse, right? Go to a dinner party um, among non-historians and raise slavery and plantations, conversation cools quickly. Um, I would argue... Well, some people get up and leave. I <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I would argue that part of what this session did and what I hope it does is to help give courage to some of these plantation sites, to recognize that there are equal number of visitors who would come and grapple with enslavement, grapple with the question of violence, which is something many of these plantations don't talk about. That yes, you'll lose some of the people who are coming to say, let me look at the decorative arts, but there are equal number of people who really want to understand what a plantation was, um, what it was as an economic system and as a social system. And I think the thing that this session really raised for me is how much there is still to do that while there are exceptions that you could point towards, you can point towards Monticello, you can look at some of the work at the Somerset Plantation, but on the whole, what you're really doing is finding ways to move these plantations, not just by inches, but by yards, to help them recognize that if slavery is central to our understanding of who we are as Americans, then it's central for those plantations to do what John O. Frank used to always tell us both, to tell the unvarnished truth. which really is translated to mean this panel will grapple with issues and challenges that flow from working at the intersection of history and memory. Or put in another way, this panel will look at what happens when the past meets the present. It really hadn't been visible, nor it had been it valued, and yet now almost everybody here would not deny the need for historians to help to shape the multiple platforms such as museums and historic sites and films and television where millions of people learn or unlearn their history. What is so key about museums is, and why historians need to be engaged, is that everything a museum does is fleeting. Conferences, books, exhibits, except the collections. So what is really crucial is that it is the museum that really preserves our cultural patrimony. And to really make sure that historians are helping to shape what museums collect, what museums document, is crucially important. One of the great challenges of public history is to give the public not just what it wants, but what it needs. And in many ways, I think our challenge is to really figure out just what are the limits of what public history is. How can we create a body of literature, critical literature, that really helps future historians understand how to wrestle with what we, what we now call public history? It seems to me, how do you help the public find a useful and usable past that instructs, that inspires, that contextualizes, that prods, that gives the public historical or cultural tools that help them live their lives, to help them live their lives through a better understanding of the past. How can we do that? What are the challenges? Can museums, can historic sites help the public do something that I really think is so important, and that is to help the public embrace the ambiguity of the past?
museums often provide simple answers to complex questions. It seems to me the question is, can museums, can these sites, can they be places outside of the academy, outside of classrooms that provide nuance, complexity, and learning that comes from embracing ambiguity? connect with the public and to find ways to, to, to engage the public in our history and to answer those questions that uh, Lonnie talked about. Nuance, ambiguity, complexity, tragedy. How do we, how do we get people engaged in that? Um, and I think we do that by finding ways to, 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 to not disremember the past, to tell the story of slavery, to not just omit the bad things or tragic things in our history, but by remembering them and combining those things with the good and create experiences that enhance uh, our life in the museum and our lives afterwards. Novelist William Faulkner, who certainly knew tragedy, said that he wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, in order to, quote, uplift our hearts, to uplift our hearts. That's a simple phrase, but spot on. And he's not referring to just my heart or your heart, but to our hearts. And we, quote, lift up our hearts, uplift our hearts by telling the truth, warts and all, about our past. If we just look at one side of history, only at the good or only at the bad or only at the elite or only at the oppressed, we don't uplift our hearts. We're in this life together, and the people of the past were no different. To deny either the evil aspects of our history or its good aspects is to defraud our past. A well-told story is often the way to do this. And for the story to be heard, the person must be prompted to care, to care about the people in the story and to feel connected to them. Now, that story may be told by text, by book, by artifacts, photographs, video, or even places and landscapes, as we'll hear about uh, in the programs, uh, in, the other, in the presentations uh, later on this panel. And if that story is well told, the public will respond and want to see that history preserved. By our own endeavors and through museums like this, we can change the perception so that history is seen as not something peripheral or extraneous for a select few, but rather central to the understanding of who we are as individuals, as a community, as a nation, and as human beings. For if history teaches us anything, it is that, future, is that, that the future will bring a surprise. What is the one ingredient for this to happen? Courage. Because if we are to maintain or mainstream an appreciation of history and start preservation in the public reckoning, we need to build bridges. For that to occur, we need courage and not give in to cynicism whose call is all too easy to heed and which can convince us that by not trying, we are being, quote, realistic. As good bridge builders know, a bridge to be effective cannot serve just one side of a divide. It cannot serve just one segment of the public. Our communities have diverse publics to connect, and those publics may not agree or even like one another. Thus, the need for us as individuals, as organizations, to have courage and to put cynicism aside. To be effective bridge builders, we need to work together uh, and ameliorate our disremembering. We need to push one another beyond our comfort zones, whatever our station in the profession or in the public, and create exp expanding circles that engage people in the preservation and interpretation of history, including its tragic moments. By the time I left that day holding still that bill of sale naming my ancestors, I had fully internalized the line from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see my ancestors. Outside the doors of history museums, urban terrain reveals the shapes of political and economic life to those who can decode buildings and landscapes. Traditionally, preservation has been a field dominated by architects and architectural historians who favor residences, clubs, and places of business owned by the wealthy and designed by celebrated architects. But urban vernacular buildings offer the possibility of interpreting everyday life and labor in American cities. <laughs> 
Over the past four decades, neglect of social history and preservation has generated some protest. People have asked, well, where are the sites of Native American or African American or Latino or Asian American history? People have asked, where are the workers' landmarks? Where is women's history? Why are the few women honored, almost never women of color? And I think one could ask, where are the slave markets, kitchenette buildings, and alley dwellings to show future generations how space was divided to enforce white supremacy? We could also ask, where are the rare neighborhoods whose diverse residents challenged the stereotypes of racial and economic segregation? The politics of identity, however they may be defined around race, gender, class, sexual orientation or neighborhood are inescapable when dealing with urban environments. Sometimes spatial history can fill silences in the archive. To study race and capitalism, for example, look at how bulldozers battered American urban landscapes in the 50s and 60s when people of color were the most frequent victims losing businesses, homes, and communities to highways and urban renewal. To explore race and power, look at how affluent white buyers displaced longtime residents of color from older buildings and neighborhoods, amplifying the damage from demolition and amplifying the damage from mortgage discrimination. Changing the priorities for preservation and commemoration is not simply a matter of acknowledging the losses from clearance and gentrification or correcting bias towards the architectural legacy of wealthy patrons. It's not enough to add a few African American, Latino, Asian American, or Native American preservation projects or a few women's projects to the landmarks lists. The intersections of multiple identities need to be addressed. As an urban landscape historian, I propose this itinerary to suggest a more inclusive way of understanding urban history. And yet, uh, many years later, I would say that the power of place, the power of ordinary urban landscapes to hold citizens' memories, to encompass shared time in the form of shared territory, still remains untapped for most working people in most American cities. To capture the power of place, to restore significant shared meanings, requires claiming the urban landscape as a material expression of political history, and then finding ways to interpret older patterns of labor that are still recognizable in the current flow of city life. James Baldwin was a public historian. Uh, we all know him as many other things, a great novelist, a great public intellectual, uh, one of the gr greatest essays in American letters, the written voice of the civil rights movement in so many ways. Uh, but he, he, was, he was a public historian. His subject so often was the nature of history and the problem of memory. He did an interview with Studs Terkel in 1961. He did zillions of interviews, as a lot of you know, and you can pull a lot of them up on YouTube. And in this interview, even though Studs Terkel was one of the great interviewers ever, he was having a tough time handling Baldwin who, as we know, was not an easy interview. Baldwin was shooting from the hip. He was angry as the Dickens, and he was complaining. America has no sense of history. America has no sense of tragedy. Americans don't, don't know their history, on and on. He answered every question before it was asked. <laughs> and Tur Turkle finally got him, settled on, settled on. Mr. Baldwin, what do you mean by a sense of history? And Baldwin in the interview does a little brief, quiet moment, and he said, well, you read something that you thought only happened to you. And you discovered that it happened 100 years ago to Dostoevsky. This is a great liberation for a suffering, struggling person who always thinks that he's alone. I've always loved that definition of what it means to have a sense of history. It means you're not alone. And it's especially important for young people. I think. Then Turkle got him to settle down and said, so what do you mean by a sense of tragedy? Baldwin goes quiet for five seconds. 
And his answer, and George, I'm so glad you are using the word tragedy. It's not a word Americans like. We don't like using that term. But anyway, Baldwin's answer. Well, people think a sense of tragedy is a kind of embroidery, something irrelevant that you can take or leave. But in fact, it is a necessity. That's what the blues and the spirituals are all about. It is the ability to look on things as they are and survive your losses, or even not survive them, to know that your losses are coming, to know they are coming, is the only possible insurance you have, a faint insurance, that you will survive them. A sense of history and a sense of tragedy is not always plentiful in America. I just want to end uh, by reminding us what maybe all of us know, but that's that this history has always been public history. Now, you can say that about all histories. It's always been public. Uh, for African Americans and their allies, this has always been a public problem. And I want to just point to one single, simple moment to illustrate that, and I'll sit down. It may seem odd at first, but it's the immediate reaction by Frederick Douglass and his community to the re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864. The 64 election, as most of you know, was probably the single most racist, white supremacist election in all of American history until the next one in 1868, <laughs> which was even worse. The Democratic Party employed white supremacist rhetoric in that election in ways that still shock people when they read it. It's, it's the year the miscegenation idea, as a word, miscegenation was coined and invented and used all over the place. Um, it, it, I don't want to go into it all, but the Republican Party, of course, shied away from the very 13th Amendment they had crafted and that had passed one House of Congress but not the other. They went virtually silent during the fall campaign on emancipation because they were under such attack from the Democrats for being the party of emancipation. They would not let Douglas go out and stump for Lincoln. They told him, please stay home, which he likened to being the deformed child who was sent out of the room when company comes. But nevertheless, when Election Day finally came and Lincoln was indeed reelected by 55% of the vote, what does Douglas do? On the Sunday after the election, he spoke at Spring Street AME, AME Church. I thought of this this morning during the religion panel. I thought, I'll, I gotta use this. Because this involves, this, this moment involves the church, the community, the nation, and what arguably is one of the oldest stories in all civilization. Douglas got up to start his lecture or speech on that Sunday, and he immediately invoked Genesis 8, Noah's Ark. He told the story, he said, you know, Noah sent the dove out to see if there was any land, and the dove came back, and then the dove's beak was an olive branch or an olive leaf. And then he says, and then Noah sent the dove out a second time, and it didn't come back. And Noah raised the tarp, and Noah looked, and the land was green. There was life. There was hope. Where does Douglas go for a moment of tr transformation, or what he saw now was at least the hope and transformation that emancipation may now actually become real? Less than a week later, he went back to Maryland for the first time in his life since he fled at age 20, 26 years since he'd stepped foot back in Maryland. He went back to Baltimore, where he spoke at the Bethel AME Church in Fells Point, the church where he probably first formally worshipped, where he may have even met Anna Murray, his future wife. At the front, end of, the, at the front of the church when he arrived was his older sister, who he hadn't seen in 28 years, Eliza Mitchell, his older sister. Uh, he hadn't seen since 1836. She met him at the door. She had come 60 miles from the Eastern Shore to see her famous brother. She had had nine children, named one of them for Douglas. 
She'd always followed his career, even though she was a non-reader. He walked arm in arm with his sister up the central aisle of Bethel AME to the front. He got up to speak. What does he do? Genesis 8. Reads the text. Tells about the dove being sent out. The dove comes back. And then he says, but today I am the dove. I am the dove. That I have come back to bald, that my feet are on the soil, that I am here, that you can see me. I am the dove. What's amazing about that is that, you know, we're always trying to figure out what's public history. What, you know, how do we make our narratives more public and how do we reach people? Douglas knew how to reach people. Everybody knew that story then. Maybe not now. But he went to the oldest rebirth story he, he had in Western civilization, the flood, to find meaning for emancipation. Thank you. I just wonder about the pipeline of curators uh, for museums and what the Smithsonian Institute and what the new museum might seek to do about diversity of hiring and ensuring that there are more people of color uh, curating museum exhibits. Good question. Yes. I am proud to say that I have the most diverse staff of any museum in America. Um, it was really important for us to frame the museum as saying African American history in many ways is the quintessential American history. And if such, then quintessentially a number of Americans should help shape it. Um, and so what we've done is that we, because this is the first job I ever had where I actually got to hire everybody, um, instead of going into a place and saying, trust me, trust me, um, that we were able to really look at the variety of pipelines, whether it's the Cooperstown Graduate Program or GW. And what we really wanted to do was to make sure that we put in place a strong series of intern and fellow and pre-doc and post-doc um, to make sure that not only do we continue to hire, but more importantly, we are the place so many people call and say, I'm looking for a good curator of X or Y. So we want to make sure that we know the pipeline so we can encourage people to do that. And I think I'm very optimistic because places like the Mellon Foundation, for example, have really helped to support us to think about how do you sort of endow curators and get pre- and postdocs in. So I think the goal for us is to not, not to be the only place that has folks who can do this, but to really do what the Smithsonian used to do. The Smithsonian used to be the place that would sort of bring people in, they would build their expertise, and then they'd go forth and serve. And so part of our goal is to make sure that we continue to not just keep all the good people, although nobody's getting out here until we open, <laughs> um, but to encourage people then to be able to take our beliefs, our attitudes, our sense of how do you do history and why it's so important, and share that around the country. Thank you. Just add, 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 add to that. And Lonnie, I think so many things uh, just spot on, but I just wanted to add to that. I think it's, it's, it, it really is crucial that we diversify our staff, and as, certainly as you professors are there, and you have students who are looking at different careers, in the field of public history, it's just not being a curator or historian. I probably had more people on my staff at Drayton Hall in marketing, PR, uh, fundraising, uh, the, the museum shop, uh, uh, business administration, all these other jobs there, you're still doing history. No, muse no history museum or historic site can survive with all this support. So it's critical that we have people around the leadership table making these decisions in marketing, PR, development from the African American community. So as you're teaching and working, please think about this breadth of jobs that are available uh, with museums in addition to education and, and historical research and interpretation. There was a great opportunity to use technology as the way in, but to bring them to the authentic. And so we've really looked at integrating technology in a variety of ways. I mean, obviously, standard hands-on interactives, but taking advantage of the fact that everybody's got their own held, 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 handheld device, how to make those programs work. Um, we've taken a lot of attempt with social media so that, in essence, the challenge for us is to basically recognize that the goal of embracing new generations is to be nimble. 
We're all going to forget things. Why bother? We're all going to forget <laughs> things in order to remember. How do we do it fairly? How do we do it with an alert sense of ethical imagination? How do we do it in a way that's responsible and accountable? Uh, I won't give an answer as long as the question, but... Um, <laughs> look, it's a terribly important point, Adam. Uh, for, 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 forgetting is always the flip side of remembering. Ernst Renan wants to find a nation as a, pleb a plebiscite of people who have decided to forget. Uh, Nietzsche warned us that there can be no collective community without some degree of forgetting. Forgetting is what we do every day. We do it in our family histories. We do it in our personal histories. We live sometimes because we can forget. But we're talking here really about structures of remembering and forgetting, structures of choices. Um, I don't think a, the function of a museum is to teach people how to forget, but at the, it, it is helping people process what they are remembering. And there are elements of the, I was just in Charleston, actually, for the civil rights pilgrimage that John Lewis leads, and we went to annual AME on Sunday morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I had the privilege of having lunch with some of the women who are survivors of victims, and they're not healing. And some of them can talk about Christian forgiveness, and some of them don't even want to hear it. It's, 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 it's a, a tremendous range of how people respond to that kind of trauma. And no one should ever impose a kind of remembering on anybody who's experienced trauma. They have to find their own way. But forgetting is always the other side of remembering. It, it simply is. <laughs>